namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama samputassa buddhang tamang sankhang namasami so i'll say a little bit more about the meditation on impermanence uh, so again, emphasizing that what we're doing here is developing a direct experience of the ephemeral, insubstantial, constantly changing nature of all things. Uh, but while doing so, uh, it's vital that the mind remains completely sharp and clear. Um, so, during the course of this meditation, your experience of your body and mind uh, might change dramatically. Uh, the uh, perception of the edge of your body might become hazy or even disappear entirely. This is normal. There's nothing wrong here. Uh, the sense of separation between your body and the outside world might disappear entirely. Again, totally normal. Uh, the apparent separation between body and mind might also disappear entirely. Again, perfectly normal. However, these things can also happen when you're falling asleep. Which is why it's so important to make sure that you stay completely awake and alert while doing this meditation. Uh, it's very easy to fool yourself like, oh yes, everything, everything's so ghostly and mirage-like, oh, oh yes, oh. But that's not the meditation on impermanence, that's just sleepy. So there's a time for that. It's at 9 p.m. You can do that kind of meditation from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. Uh, but the rest of the time, I want you to do the kind where the mind is extremely alert, extremely aware. Another important thing is that we're not trying to force any particular experience. So what we are doing is paying attention to the impermanent nature of all things. That's what we are doing. That's something which is already there something which has always been there. We just normally don't pay any attention to it. In fact, normally we project the appearance of solid, persistent objects. That's the world that we're used to living in, a world where a solid, persistent body is on a solid, persistent cushion on a solid, persistent floor, uh, being presided over by a continuously operating mind, which is basically the same as it's always been. That's the delusion that we usually live in. So with the perception on, uh, of impermanence, with this meditation on impermanence, uh, technically speaking, all we're doing is just dropping our delusion of permanence. So we're not creating a new experience. We're simply dropping the delusional overlay from our experience. Uh, but since we're so used to the, the delusional overlay of permanence, it feels like we're, we're creating a new experience. It can feel that way. Uh, but just to be clear, that, that's technically not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're drawing attention to something that's always been there, something that's always been present. Uh, like the feeling of your clothing against your skin. Now that I'm mentioning it, who's noticing the feeling of clothing against your skin? Who was not noticing it before I mentioned it? Pretty much everyone, okay. But it's been here all along, hasn't it? I'd hope so anyway. <laughs> um, again, I don't know what happened the last few minutes when I was out of the room, but hopefully the sensation of clothing on the skin has always been here. Uh, but it's only when we turn our attention to it that we notice it. So we aren't creating a new experience. Uh, we're not generating the experience of clothing against the skin. We're just noticing what was already there. But it takes a certain amount of willpower to actively notice that. 
because it's not our habit to actively notice it. In fact, it's our habit to actively ignore it. So it takes a certain amount of effort to willingly notice what we normally ignore. So that's the perception of impermanence, this meditation on impermanence. It's noticing what's always been there, but which we normally ignore, we habitually ignore. Um, another aspect of this, this particular meditation practice, uh, as it gets more, so uh, the, the early stage of it, as I mentioned earlier, is simply noticing change. Uh, and this is a, a relatively coarse way of doing the meditation, but it's, it's usually uh, one of the easier ways to get started with it. So change is noticing the difference between adjacent moments. So noticing, for example, that right now your body feels a little bit different than it did a second ago. Or noticing that right now your mind feels a little bit different than it did a second ago. Uh, that's one way of doing the perception of impermanence. It's very coarse, it's not very subtle or very refined, but it's an entry point because it's starting to break down the idea of solid persisting objects. It's starting to, to wear that away. So that's a good place to start. Uh, and spend as long as you need on that step uh, until it becomes very familiar, until it becomes perfectly normal. Uh, the next step after that uh, is to recognize that, uh, so, okay, so change implies that there's a persisting object which is changing. Uh, this is why I say it's a pretty coarse, unrefined way of doing this, this meditation, but often it's the only real way to start because we're so used to perceiving the world in terms of persistent, stable objects. Um, the next one is to see it in terms of arising and ceasing, or appearing and vanishing. So rather than think of it that I have this body, and I've had this body for the last 10 minutes, and over the course of that 10 minutes, it's changed a bunch of times. So instead of thinking it in, the, in that way, what we can recognize is rather this moment, a set of physical sensations appeared. Then they disappeared. The next moment, a set of physical sensations appeared, and then they disappeared. The next moment, another set of physical sensations appeared, and then disappeared. Do you understand? So it's breaking entirely the idea of a continuous chain, but rather seeing it as distinct moments of appearing and vanishing. Uh, a pink, uh, distinct moments of uh, arising and ceasing. Uh, so right now, body and mind appears, and then instantly disappears. There's no persistence. It lasts for a single instant, which is very short, by the way. Uh, shorter than the snap of a finger. It's very, very brief. Uh, so uh, that's the, the second step in this meditation, is noticing arising and ceasing, uh, appearing and vanishing. Uh, a next step after that uh, is recognizing that the appearing and vanishing happen at exactly the same time. Uh, which means that whatever we're paying attention to is both present and not present at the same time. So depending on how you look at it, uh, we could say that whatever we're faced with um, both exists and does not exist at the same time. Did I lose anyone? This is normally where I start losing people. Okay, so um, keep in mind, this is the third stage in this meditation. So if you haven't even figured out the first stage, the third one's not going to make any sense to you. Uh, but just to give you a bit of a roadmap as to what, what you're going to run into. So for example, right now, if I tell you, uh, if you get in a car and drive west, then you'll go past a bunch of cornfields, and then you'll go over some really tall Rocky Mountains, and then you'll uh, see the Pacific Ocean. So, general outline. Then you get out in your car, and you're like, I don't see any mountains. It's like, well, of course not. You're not there yet. Don't worry about it. Keep driving. Eventually, you'll see the mountains. It might take two or three days. 
depending on how fast you drive and how many breaks you take and so on. Um, but you will eventually see the mountains and eventually you'll get past the mountains and you'll see the Pacific Ocean. Is that right? Yeah, Pacific Ocean is west. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, the trouble with using geography metaphors is that my geography isn't very good. It's like west, east, Atlantic, <laughs> Pacific. Anyway. Uh, so it's the same. Uh, so you start with what you can get a handle on and you stay with that until it's familiar and comfortable and then you move on. Like with the loving-kindness meditation, uh, if I just tell you to focus on the feeling of limitless benevolence with no sense of self and other, you'll just be like, uh, what? How does that work? So we start with something like, oh, think of someone you love and how much you love them, and it's like, okay, my cat, I love my cat. And then you're started. <laughs> you're starting on metta. Uh, it's not the most refined way to do metta, but it's a start. It gets you going. So in the same way, uh, noticing the constant change in experience, noticing the constant change in, in what we're feeling is a way to get started on the perception of impermanence. It's not the most refined way of practicing this meditation, but it will get you on the road. Uh, so you stay with it for as long as you can, and for as long as you need to in order to be fully comfortable with it. Then you can try to uh, refine it uh, to the stage of noticing uh, appearing and vanishing. And you stay with that for as long as you need to, uh, until you can come to the point of noticing uh, simultaneous existence and non-existence. So this is admittedly a fairly refined perception. Uh, so, realistically, are you going to get that in the next 24 hours before the retreat ends? Probably not. That's okay. Because you're going to come to the 28-day retreat in January, so you don't need to worry about it. You'll have plenty of time then to figure it out. Um, and hopefully you're going to be meditating four hours a day for the rest of your life anyway, so you'll get plenty of opportunity to figure this out. So another uh, aspect of this meditation that I mentioned briefly earlier is uh, that what we think of as the sharp, discrete edges to our experience starts to blur. So for example, the edge of the body starts to blur uh, and can even disappear entirely. Um, so again, this is something that it's normal uh, because when you pay attention to it, what is the body? The body is a collection of sensations that, depending on what stage we're looking at it, are either constantly changing or appearing and vanishing or simultaneously existing and not existing. Maybe I just won't mention that one for now. We'll just drop that for now. Okay, so it's either constantly changing or uh, constantly appearing and vanishing. Uh, well, that means that the edge of our body is also constantly changing, constantly appearing and vanishing. It's different moment by moment. So, like normally we think uh, this is the edge of our body, but as we start to develop the perception of impermanence, that edge of the body starts to seem not so clearly defined, not so consistent. Then we get to the stage of appearing and vanishing, and sometimes it's here, and sometimes it's here, and sometimes it's here, and sometimes there's not anything there at all. There's no edge to the body at all. But for this to be possible, we have to be willing to let go of our body. We need to be willing to allow the experience of our body to cease. To be perfectly comfortable with not having a body. So you kind of ease your way into it. Because what normally happens is that as that experience slowly starts to appear on the horizon, we're just like, oh dear, not that. Uh, and we flinch back. We flinch back into the delusion of permanence uh, because it's comfortable. Um, 
And then slowly we start peeking through our eyes and we're like, okay, okay, maybe the body is not quite as solid as I thought it was. Uh, and we resume the meditation again. And then uh, again, the body starts to, the experience of the body starts to change uh, in ways that we're, we're maybe not quite comfortable with and not quite ready to face up to. So again, it's important to remember uh, that reality itself is not any different than it always has been. Uh, so all throughout meditation practice, reality simply is what it has been since beginning this time and what it always will be. Reality doesn't change, it's just the way things are. What changes is whether or not we see it. That's what changes. So all we're doing with this meditation practice is seeing reality as it is. So your body as it really is, not as you think it is, but your body as it really is, will still be the same after the meditation as it was before the meditation. But that's because your body is not what you think it is. Uh, it's not even close, by the way. It's not what you think it is. So technically, what we're letting go of is not our body, because there is no such thing. Uh, what we're letting go of is our delusional concepts about our body. That's something that we should be quite willing to let go of. Because those delusional concepts are not doing us any good. In fact, they're hindering us. They're preventing us from cultivating uh, wisdom, uh, happiness, and compassion, understanding. Uh, they're preventing us from moving por forward at the path. Uh, so we should be more than willing to let go of any delusion that's present, no matter how much we like it. Uh, there must be the willingness to let go of any delusion that's present. Uh, and there also has to be the willingness to acknowledge that our habitual experience of the world is probably wrong. Which means we need to be willing to let go of it. We need to be willing to experience the world in a different way than what we're used to. This also means that the way we've been experiencing the world since before we can remember is also probably wrong which means we need to be open to experiencing the world in a completely different way. So if you approach this, uh, this meditation practice with this kind of attitude, uh, then you can make swift progress. Uh, then you can start to break through uh, some of the, the deeply rooted misperceptions about reality. We can start to break through some of the, the deep set delusions that we've been carrying since beginning this time, since before we can possibly hope to remember. Uh, because of this, it's also, uh, it can be quite difficult. Again, it sounds like a simple thing. Just notice impermanence. It sounds like a simple thing. But because it so directly challenges some of our most deeply rooted delusions, You'll find an incredible amount of resistance in the mind when practicing this meditation. The mind continuously recoils in horror at the possibility that it might actually be delusional. So I've got some bad news for you. You're all delusional. So am I. That's why we're here. We're here to try to do something about that. Uh, yeah, so first acknowledging, yeah, this is going to be challenging. Uh, it's going to be difficult. Uh, but we make the effort. And it's, it's this dance of you put forth a little bit of effort and the mind recoils in horror. You put forth a little more effort and the mind recoils. You put forth a little more effort and the mind tries to fall asleep. And you put forth a little more effort and the mind runs off into random thinking. And you put forth a little more effort and over and over again, constantly just trying, 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 and slowly things start to change. The mind starts to change. Uh, but it takes persistence, uh, it takes dedication, it takes willpower, it takes effort. Uh, but over time, things do change. The mind is malleable, the mind is trainable. Uh, if we make the effort to shape it, if we make the effort to train it, 
then we can make it into whatever we wish it to be. So, Buddhist meditation is about shaping this mind uh, into a Buddha mind. And developing the perception of impermanence is one way that we go about doing that. Uh, because a Buddha is fully aware that everything is impermanent, that everything is insubstantial. They're fully aware of this every single moment. So this is one aspect of the Buddha mind, is the Buddha mind has constant perception of impermanence, unremitting perception of impermanence, unremitting awareness of impermanence. So there's a few surprising aspects of this meditation. Uh, one, as I mentioned earlier, a sense of freedom, a sense of, of boundlessness. Uh, a sense of, of opening up into this enormous open space, which again has always been here. It's never been anywhere else. Uh, because we're no longer trapped by our ideas about what we think the world is. We're no longer trapped within the little box that we've been creating for ourselves all along. We start to realize that that little prison that we live in mm, is not quite real. That little prison that we've been living in for longer than we can remember, it's, it's, it's an illusion. The walls are only as solid as we think they are. So there starts to be this sense that just beyond our distorted perception, there's vast, limitless open space. So there's a sense of, of openness. Uh, boundlessness that can start to emerge with this, this practice. There can also start to appear a sense of joy, a sense of lightness and ease. Uh, realizing that the heavy burden we've been carrying around all this time is actually as light as air. It's insubstantial. It's nothing that we need to keep lugging around. So the burden I'm referring to is our misperceptions about body and mind. Uh, this huge weight on our back that we, we don't even realize there's any other option. Brings me back to when I was in high school. Uh, so when I was in high school, um, so everyone had these huge backpacks stuffed full of books and at one point I weighed mine and my, my backpack weighed like 25 pounds which was just insane. And that's almost as much as I weighed back then. So my backpack weighed 25 pounds. I'm not even kidding. I weighed like 100, 125 pounds. So my backpack weighed a lot. And this was normal. This is what most people were doing. And after my first year in high school, one day it just suddenly occurred to me like, why am I carrying all this stuff around? I don't need to carry all this stuff around. So I just stopped. I stopped carrying a backpack. Stopped bringing my books to classes. Uh, which, <laughs> this doesn't mean I was a bad student. I mean, I passed, I passed high school. I did graduate. Not the best grades in the world, but I did graduate. Um, but there was, there was the realization at some point that I didn't need to carry this huge burden with me all the time. And there was a sense of, of such lightness and ease. That came. The first day I was just like, yeah, I'm just not going to use a backpack today. I'm not going to carry 25 pounds of books around today. And it was fine. I had to structure my day a little bit differently in order to make it possible. Uh, in order to make sure I could get uh, access to things I needed at the times I needed them. Uh, but I felt so much better. Uh, and there was also the realization that 99% of the students in that school had no idea this was even a possibility. Because I saw everybody else going around with this huge bag all the time. And I was like, well, it doesn't really need to be that way. I used to think it needed to be that way, but clearly I was wrong. Uh, clearly there's another way, a way to live life that's unburdened, that's light and joyful. 
Well, it's the same. We're constantly carrying around this huge burden of what we think our body is and what we think our body should be and what we think our mind is and what we think our emotions are and what we think our thoughts are and, and what we think our identity is. This huge burden. And so with this meditation practice, we can start to lighten the load a little bit. We can start to put the burden down. Start to realize that the burden's not quite real after all. It's not necessary. It's something that we create with our own mind, with our own delusional mind. So there's a sense of lightness and joy when we start to put that down. We also start to recognize that the mind can be whatever we wish it to be. Uh, we're not trapped by the habits and patterns that we've had in the past. We're not trapped by the personality traits that we've had in the past. We're not trapped by the self-perceptions that we've had in the past. We can drop all of that. Uh, and when we drop all of that, then we recognize that we can, we can make this mind whatever we want it to be. We can point it in whatever direction we want it to be. Uh, or we can drop wanting to be anything in particular, uh, which allows us to open up into the vast, spacious joy of the Buddha mind. It allows us to start to recognize what the Buddha was talking about. Uh, when he said the relinquishment of acquisition is true happiness. What was he talking about? We start to see that we've been acquiring all these ideas about body and mind, all these ideas about self and other. We've been acquiring this, this stockpile of, of limited, narrow experiences of the world. Uh, which is all, it's all making us very uncomfortable. Uh, fortunately, when we look at it through the lens of impermanence, it melts away. Start to realize that mm, there's nothing there worth holding on to. There's nothing there that's worth clinging to. It's worth persisting in. We can let it drop. It's not doing us any good. So uh, this meditation practice, uh, in order for it to be effective, uh, it needs to drive right to the base of the subconscious mind. Uh, so this is why we spent so much time developing samadhi first, uh, is to give the the power right, and force uh, behind this meditation practice. Again, it's kind of like uh, a hammer and a nail. Uh, so you want to put a nail in something and you show up with just a nail. Anybody ever tried to drive a nail into a piece of wood without a hammer? How, would it, how well did that go? <laughs> did that go pretty well? Not so well? <laughs> Not so well. Uh, it works if you have extremely soft wood that's very thin. But generally speaking, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, on the other hand, what if you go with just a hammer? You're just whacking at the wood with a piece of with, whacking at a piece of wood with a hammer. That doesn't help very much either, does it? So you need both a hammer and a nail, like a good sturdy, sharp nail. Uh, and a good, heavy, balanced hammer. So, uh, similarly in our practice, uh, the perception of impermanence needs to be very sharp and precise, like a nail. Uh, but it needs to have that weight, balance, and force behind it, which is samadhi, uh, in order to really drive it deeply into the mind. Otherwise, uh, I mean, you can take a nail and you can scratch little designs on the surface of the wood but you can't really drive it deep into the wood without a good heavy hammer. Uh, so it's the same. If we try to just go directly to doing insight meditation without first developing samadhi, we'll just kind of scratch at the surface of the mind 
We might make some pretty patterns on the surface of the mind, but we're not really changing anything. We're not getting deep. Uh, we're not getting down to what, what really needs to be done. Uh, so always, 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 with this approach to meditation anyway, uh, we develop very strong samadhi. Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning of this retreat, I mentioned the three strategies the Buddha spoke about, and all three of them involve samadhi. Uh, the Buddha never, ever, ever spoke about a vipassana-only way to enlightenment. Ever. Never mentioned it. Always he spoke about vipassana in combination with samadhi. Uh, so whether you do the samadhi first or in the middle or simultaneously, there's always samadhi involved. Uh, so build up that samadhi. When you've got at least a little bit of samadhi, uh, start driving that perception of impermanence uh, into our experience. Let it splinter and shatter uh, our misperceptions about reality. Uh, be willing to experience a completely different world than you're used to. Be willing to see yourself in a completely different way than you're used to. And just resolutely, faithfully apply the perception of impermanence and see what happens. See what happens. So I think that's all I'm going to say at this point. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and end there and we can do some meditation practice. <coughs>